You ready for the word today? This is a football. And you're already like, we're already off track. No, this is a football. It was July of 1961, and the Green Bay Packers We do have security, and we will enforce if necessary. Um, but they came back on the heels of a lead they squandered late in the fourth quarter, womp, 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 um, the previous season where they lost the NFL championship to the Philadelphia Eagles. So, mm, sorry. I mean, it could have at least been a good team like the Steelers, right? So, come on. So, you got a bunch of men that have been thinking about this loss the entire offseason. They're down in the dumps. They squandered a late fourth quarter lead. They went all the way through. Training camp is here. It's time. We're going to get to work. The legendary Vince Lombardi walks in the room and says, this is a football to 38 professional athletes, he began with, this is a football. And from that point on, he began this tradition of starting from scratch every single year in training camp. He began to go over the basics and that where these pros would learn how to tackle again, how to block again, how to catch again, how to do all of the basic things again. Just months later, uh, or excuse me, he just he covered all these fundamentals and all that. And six months later, they would beat the New York Giants 37 to nothing in the NFL championship. Thank you all. Smart people. Smart crowd today. He made the fundamentals first. Vince Lombardi would never coach a team with a losing record. He became the greatest. The Super Bowl trophy is called the Vince Lombardi trophy for a reason. But every season with people who knew what they were doing, they were pros, they were paid to do this thing. He went back to the basics, back to the fundamentals, even to point to say this is a football. So help me out, Pete. The reason he has to have that is because I might get excited and spike it, or if I sling it at one of you and you're not expecting it, it could be bad. So there you go. So what are you saying, Pastor Paul? I'm saying that the church and believers need to not get away from the basics. Pastor Jeremy started a series, the gospel, uh, sometime back, and, and uh, I had this stirred in my spirit. I thought, well, if things go and whatever, if I'm asked in anywhere in this time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share this. So we're kind of continuing in, in that series of the gospel. It's just that what I want to do today and what I hope to articulate today is very, very simple. And I've got notes here with supporting stuff and, and, and statements and all that. But at the end of the day, I really just hope that I'm able to articulate what's in my heart for what I see and, and, and what I believe God wants to say today. So what I would add to today, to, just to denote it a little bit, would be the gospel warning. And so... With that said, you know, when we think about the basics, getting back to the fundamentals and what what we see today with change that's happening at record pace for organizations, institutions, everybody's pressured to stay with the latest technology and fads and trends and whatever, and the church is not exempt. There are many things that are taking place in church that, I mean, you would never think of in terms of experience and all that. I mean, even here, you may not see it, and we haven't said a lot about it lately. We are still pushing towards some major renovation in this auditorium. You may see some smaller things that some are just temporary. 
and uh, low cost because we're doing a lot of homework and studying where we're for the heart for the house where we hope to raise a campaign, uh, raise money through a campaign to continue to do things. So that hasn't ended. We just haven't been pushing it a lot this summer. We're still putting a lot of things together. A lot of the things, unfortunately, you won't even be able to see because it's infrastructure. It's things that it just takes to do different things. But we're all squeezed into this box. The easy way to say it is cultural relevance. And the church feels this same pressure because of the number of people who claim they have no religion is increasing. So churches are closing their doors because people are walking away, leaving their faith. So then the church can get squeezed into this thing of what do we do to draw people, right? If we're not careful, we get into this cycle. And unfortunately, we could get into a cycle where churches are competing for many of the same people rather than competing for people who have not yet heard. I would go out on a limb and say this, that even though there are so many churches in this city, I would say that that. If you took every church's seating capacity, you wouldn't be able to fill it with everyone in this city. You wouldn't be able to fill it. There'd be, there'd be room. So we have work to do. But our work is not just to get into a competition. Hello? About what goes on and what takes place. I, I tell you today that our message and the gospel has a warning. Why do people walk away from their faith? When things get tough, when there's a struggle, is it because that the gospel they heard or the gospel they pursued was different, that, that they missed some of the basics of that? So I tell you the truth, like I do soon to be parents, following Jesus can be hard. Anybody in the room know that? Following Jesus can be hard. I remember watching the series. I think it's The Chosen. Has anybody seen that? It's this crazy scene, and I don't want to get too far off track, but it was probably my most favorite scene of the whole thing. And Jesus has been out healing people all day long. There's just, I mean, just going and going and going. And the disciples are over here going, man, I wish we just wouldn't have stopped here or like they're over here doing this stuff or whatever. And, and Jesus finally comes walking back, and I'm butchering the scene, but he comes walking back, and one of the disciples runs to him and says something, and Jesus just looks at him and just keeps on walking and goes in to lay down because of what they were bickering over, their uncomfortableness or whatever. Have people come and received a gospel based on something that is not actually accurate? not true. This is a true story. A man I know, man of God, who was asked to come and address a minor league team for a major league team. I won't tell you the name. It's not important, the name of the team or this man, but I know him personally. And the minor league coach asked this man to come in and explain to some of his players because many of them were international and they had given their life to Christ. But some of the men ended up getting cut from the team. And some of the men, they're, they're, they weren't improving and so on and so forth. And they're kind of some of their frustration was they said, but, but, but I gave my life to Christ. What did somebody tell them? That everything got perfect? That everything got better, including your batting percentage? Let me help you out. It gets better when you work hard at it. Hello? If church becomes a place where it's relegated to the people coming together to celebrate their morality their, and, and all this and their self-improvement and, and so on and so forth, modified behavior and uh, all of that, people that come on a different, for a different reason, they begin to realize that there are people outside the walls of the church who are good people, who have things and are happy. How many of us, we don't understand it, but they're happy. But that's not what the kingdom is about. 
So the church finds itself feeling some of the same pressures to reach the public. We've seen denominations completely change some of their theology to include more people. So that it's no longer empty spaces. It's not so orthodox that people feel like their lifestyle is pushed out and, and, and all of this. So they begin to change things so that they can attract a crowd and perhaps have influence. A.W. Tozer said, Modern religion focuses upon filling church with people. The true gospel emphasizes filling people with God. Could it be that the church needs to look to historical Christianity instead of trying to constantly find new ways to attract people? It's like remaking a movie. You know, when you hear... you. Maybe you had this childhood favorite. I'm not saying this is my favorite, but sometimes there's just, it's just, you can't do that, right? For me, what comes to mind is Karate Kid. You ain't duplicating Mr. Miyagi. You, you ain't doing this over any better. Let's just stick with the original, <laughs> Right? You know, uh, real, so Hollywood, it's reality TV, right? Reality TV came on like around 2000, somewhere in there, late 90s. I, I remember that because the very first show I remember is Survivor. And what I remember is uh, I, I watched the very first season and I never watched another season. Now, some of y'all are like, how in the world? Like, I just get bored, okay? But I watched the first season and that was it. And then many years later, my wife and I start watching this show, and it's a reality show, and it's very similar. The people were in this island. I don't even remember the name of it now. And then all of a sudden, one of the participants disappears. Everybody's like, he, he, he went, oh, and they can't find him. I mean, it gets where the, the crew, the filming crew, and the produ all these people are involved like, what happened? And your mind, then another one started disappear, disappearing. Another one. It's like, what is going on on this show? And then one of the crew members, the production crew, goes missing. And we're watching it. I finally looked at my wife. I was like, I know what this is. She was like, what? I said, this ain't even a reality show. It is a show about a reality show. Now, I can spell it out if you want me to. But if we're not careful, we can get into doing something that's not what it thinks, but it's only mimicking that. We have to be careful. It's not our programs. It's not our politics. It's not our preferences that will save anyone. It's the gospel. Romans 1.16 for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. The Bible says that the gospel itself is the power. Now to us, apart from first century Jews, you know, we, when we think gospel, we think Jesus crucified, uh, dead, buried, rose again. I want to tell you that reference to the gospel is in the scripture before Jesus ever died. The first century Jew knew the, the things that were coming. It's good news. Here's my concern, is that there's often appeal to the gospel in the Western world that I fear leaves out some of the very basic reasons for sharing it. Here in the West, we're often preaching a gospel that's based on a blessing or a benefit intrinsically and extrinsically, while around the world, the gospel is preached and received despite severe consequences. That part came from something the Lord spoke to me a long time ago where he said, here we preach a gospel based on promised blessings while all around the world, people come to Christ despite the curse. No, you don't see it in the news every day. You will not. We have an amazing uh, foreign missions uh, program through Global Infusions, which is a standalone but very much a part of this church. Ask them. Some of the places that, that they go to and, 
And if you know about what's going around in the world, do you know that some of the greatest revival is happening in places like Iran? So imagine you, you hear this gospel from somebody who's definitely bold <laughs> and led of the Spirit to believe and know that you are going to receive, possibly. Because if you don't receive, you might kill them. So now, when I say we talk about all the niceties and the good things about the gospel here in the West, can you imagine having to make the decision to tell your family that you have become a believer in Christ? One, because at the very least, they, they will probably disown you. If you're lucky. And if you're not lucky, they will kill you. Now, what kind of gospel is that? The bottom line is, is that they, they are coming to Christ in droves for one very simple reason. Because their eyes are on eternity. It's not on this earth. It's not on this world. And so people are coming to Christ over and over and over. And the gospel is exploding because they know that there is a warning inside that that says, if you do not receive Christ... You will spend eternity in hell. There is eternal damnation. Christ is the only way. He is the only one who even ever claimed to pay for your sins. Muhammad, Buddha, none of those people ever even claimed it. Yet when they hear this, in spite of what they know may come their way, they're saying yes over and over again. I'm telling you this because you know we struggle here some. And we've got brothers and sisters around the world that when they hear the gospel, they have to make a decision. If I tell my family, I'm going to at very least be disowned. They might kill me. But if I don't tell my family, they may never know. The gospel is exploding in these areas. People are deciding to follow Christ and their only expectation is that when they breathe their last breath, they will dance on streets of gold. That they will stand before a risen Savior who paved the way for them to have that life. Luke verse 10, uh, chapter 10, verse 20. Jesus, in, in, in uh, Luke 9, he, he sent them out. He, he told them to go out and to proclaim the gospel, to, to, uh, to heal and to drive out demons, but to preach the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is synonymous with the Jews for the day of judgment. So he's saying, go out and heal the people. Go out and drive out demons. Why is it? Just so they get to experience that, it was in preparation for a day to come. This is what it's going to look like when we're all healed. This is what it will look like when evil doesn't torment people. It was a, a portraying, it was a, a foreshadowing. So he said, go out and do these things and proclaim the kingdom of God or proclaim a day of judgment. Our message has a warning. It has a warning. And in verse 20 of chapter 10, he says, However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you. What does he say? Rejoice that your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. That's what's here. That's what's paramount is that our names are written in the book of life so that when we step in, the Bible tells us that one day we will give full account for our life. I'm telling you, I'm afraid that in many places around this country particularly, but in other areas, people will flock to an auditorium. They will tune in to hear about how they can get better and how they can have this and how they can do that and all these things. And we're forgetting to tell them that if you do not lay your life down and surrender your life to the one and only name by which you can be saved, we are doing them a serious injustice.
See, what we don't read, or it, it continues on. He said, go out and do this. And by the way, don't take any money with you. Don't take any bread with you. You just go. How many of you signed up for that gospel? See, that's what was the early days. We've lost some of that that says we need to produce fruit. And I'm not talking about works righteousness. No, I'm not. But if you are a believer in Christ, you have a call to produce fruit for the kingdom. Take no staff, take no bread, take no money. Just go and proclaim. Those are not the things that we say to people today when we're trying to get them to come to church or accept Jesus, is it? Are we looking at people saying, you know, it may cost you your life. If not literally, symbolically. Because serving God in the kingdom of God means we lay our life down for our brother, for our sister. It means that we there's sacrifice. There's a doctor, a surgeon. Know this story firsthand as well. That he was a very good surgeon here in the states and made a lot of money. He was a specialist. Was on the mission field in a very hot, miserable place. A tent. Inside this tent lay a child. They went in. There was a surgery that would last two to three hours. There's pouring sweat. There's all this, you know, it's just not nice. It's not a nice surgery room, operating room like we have. This surgeon from the States. And after this was all over, he comes out and someone comes to him and says, well, what do you, what do you think? He said, I believe they're going to be okay. And they're going to make it. And he said, you know, I just got to ask. Like, do you get something for this here? He goes, eh, you know, maybe a chicken. His wife's walking beside him. And the person says, what would you get for this in the United States? He said, oh, thousands of dollars. His wife's beside him, and he just looks at his wife. This man can hear, and he says, Oh, but this, this right here is living. That's the gospel. All of our discipleship is about a day that will come. It's not just so that we can be a better person or so that we can reap the benefits or, or, or what have you. Now, before you get your stones out, I know where I am. Okay, I believe in healing. I believe there's healing for the saints. I believe there's, there's all of these things, but I want to be real honest with you. I have seen people come to Christ and everything didn't get put back in place. I've seen people come to Christ and things still fell apart. I've seen people come to Christ and financial ruin still comes. And if they came for those reasons, that's why I can answer your question and say they walked out the door. But when we say this is about your eternity, this is about where you will spend eternity, then perhaps it will be easier to say, I've got my eyes on the prize. I'm going to keep my eyes, the author and the perfecter of my faith, and I'm going to continue to walk day in and day out. You know, that is the hardest thing for a believer to do. We all want something grandiose. We want something big that's spotlight. But the hardest thing you will do as a believer is every day just put one foot in front of the other and do the day in and the day out. The Bible tells us what good is it for a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul, Mark eight thirty six. The toughest prayer I ever prayed was when my father was sick with cancer. I asked the Lord, over and over, I asked the Lord, heal him, heal him, heal him. For, for a year, I prayed. I, I shed many tears in this sanctuary in my home, on my face before God. I, I'd never seen my dad serve the Lord. 
It was an answered prayer. He was clinging to the cross. In his hospital room uh, when he was diagnosed, he poured out and confessed everything and came to the Lord. So like any good believer, I was like, this means he's going to be healed. He's coming. He's coming around. God's going to do it. And time kept going, and he wasn't healed, and he wasn't healed, and he wasn't healed. And oh, did he have faith. Every time I heard my dad pray for one year, he said, I believe you are the son of the living God. I believe you were crucified. I believe you died. I believe you were buried and you rose again on the third day. What? God, you, you, you got to heal him. Near the end, I just thought, wow. How is this? And I remembered the story of the lepers were only one. Return to give thanks. And so I prayed a different prayer. And I said, oh God, if there is one, one millionth of a chance that he would walk away and forget your name if you healed him on this earth, let him die clinging to the cross. That doesn't sound like fun, does it? It wasn't. But the ultimate prize was to be healed for all eternity, not just walking on this earth. Hello? I know that today, though I lost my father way too soon, I keep him for eternity. I believe that's where he is. Did I want him healed? You bet I did. But more than that, I wanted him to gain the ultimate prize, which was eternal life with Jesus. I've told people recently, this isn't about getting your family back. It's not about getting your business back, your home back. It's about coming to Christ regardless of anything works out. You either want him for who he is or you don't want him. He is the one that suffered and endured and paid the price for you to have eternal life. And that is enough. You don't know when you will take your last breath. God forbid. We know we've seen things recently where you, you just don't know. People take their last breath. You want to be ready because none of that other stuff matters at that point. And see, it's in crisis that people can be the most open, right? They're walking through something. And so sometimes as believers, we've been praying, so maybe for a coworker, a family member, whatever, and we're going, oh, this is it. And, and we start going, come to church. Now, you need to come to church. Now, I'm not saying that's bad, okay? Just hear me out. And, you, and let me tell you, this can all be right. If you do not start with, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And you need salvation because the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. That is the starting point. That is where it is. If we start down a road of trying to say that there's this thing and everybody's just going to get fixed and it's going to get right, we're forgetting the warning. This is about eternity. Even if you're healed, if demons are driven out, rejoice that your name is written in the book of life, written in heaven. Martin Luther said, that to progress in the Christian life, we always need to begin again. Begin at, we have all sinned. We all fall short. We are in need of a Savior. We come to Jesus to repent and receive forgiveness of sin that only He can give. It's not about having a personal success coach. It's not just about self-improvement. It's about eternity. Pastor Josh, Jonathan, if you will come. If we forget to tell people there's only one name by which man can be saved and his name is Jesus. That he walked this earth sinless. That he was crucified. That he was buried and that he rose again. If we leave that out, we're doing an injustice. In 2004, Indonesia was hit by a tsunami. Many of you may remember that. 
island of Aceh or Banda Aceh, I believe, was hit and 167,000 people died. While on an island right beside it, only six or seven people died. The reason given that so few people perished on that island compared to Aceh was because of an institution. The church is an institution. The institution is a storytelling institution. We have a story to tell. The storytellers are the elders of the island, and they told stories to the children. Their stories always ended with a warning to the children. This warning contains something so important based on experience. The warning tells of what to do when there was a strong uh, tremor and the sea would withdraw. So they would end every story no matter what it was about. Every story closed with a warning. And that warning was, if you feel the ground begin to shake and you see the sea withdraw from the shore, run for the hills because the the sea will return to the shore in a rush. So when the people of the island of Samule, I don't even know if I'm saying that anywhere close, but when they felt this tremor and they saw the ocean withdraw, they ran for the hills. And six or seven people died versus 167,000 people. Why? Because they kept the importance of the warning going. The obedience, the seriousness in which they held this great practice prevented thousands upon thousands from dying. There is a chance that there wasn't anybody even alive that remembered the last tsunami to hit those islands. It was 1907, nearly 100 years that they kept this practice My question is, what would happen if they had stopped telling this? You know, we hadn't seen one in a long time, and we ain't felt this, and we ain't seen that, just, you know. Can we just stop doing this after we tell Duck, Duck, Goose, or whatever? After we tell this story and that story? Why do we throw this hard warning that could take any good story and make it go, ooh, why? Because it was life and death. And we have a story. And no matter what story we're telling and no matter who we encounter, our story has a warning. And that warning is, is that if you do not understand and if you do not give your life to Jesus Christ, you will spend eternity in hell. This is not a popular thing in pulpits around this world today. Particularly in the West. But I'm telling you, it's our warning, and we need not lose our message. And so likewise, the church should have the same commitment. Amen? We can come in, and we can celebrate, and we can worship our Savior like nobody else. But don't kid yourself. We better be letting people know that there's only one Savior. His name is Jesus. It's the only way people for centuries have lost lost their lives for us to hear this message today right even here in Tennessee the denomination that this church is in the hills of Polk County and down that way people lost their life for this message I'm I'm pleading with the church and with believers that it doesn't stop with us. That it's not about our comforts and our luxuries here. That's about one day. It's about one day. If you're healed, praise God. Let that healing point to one day. Let it be a story and a testimony to say, you know what? One day, Pastor Josh, you'll be totally healed. If it's not on this earth, it will be forever. But let us not forget that we have a warning with the gospel. He was born of a virgin. 
he was crucified. He was buried. And on the third day, he rose again. And he is the only way to the Father. And one day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Do not forget that. If you come to this altar for prayer, amen. If you come to this altar for prayer, do not be surprised if a prayer team member starts with asking you, have you been born again? Don't be offended, church. Why am I saying that? Because all over this country today, people will pack into auditoriums and they will come in and they've never confessed their sin. They've never repented. They've never asked Jesus to be Lord of their life, but they will come down here and let you pray for them. They want you to pray for everything in their life. They want you to pray for everybody else that's bad. Hello? Fair warning. Prayer team members, if somebody comes down and says, I need you to pray for somebody, look at them and say, have you been born again? Everybody wants everybody else fixed, don't they? Oh, we know it firsthand. We know people that cried out and wanted their spouse saved. Problem is, their spouse got saved and they got really saved and then they left them. How do you figure that? They got a little too saved. (laughs) My point is, is that we need to deal with sin and we, we need to focus on eternity. We encounter this every day. It's not just here. You have people you run into. Please, when you tell the story, don't forget the warning. Don't leave out the warning. Amen. Can you stand to your feet? We're going to prepare to take communion. If you didn't get it on the way in, if you will just raise your hand, someone will bring it to you. The Bible tells us that when we do this, we should examine ourselves. Not our friend, not our neighbor, definitely not your spouse. Examine yourself. I want to give you a little warning. Maybe you you know Christ, you've walked with Christ. But you've opened the door. Things aren't going the right way and you need some kind of comfort. You need some kind of luxury. You've opened the door, you've cracked it to, to let sin, something enter back in. I want to warn you that God wants you whole. His blood was shed for you to be free from sin, not to cope with sin. There's righteousness. Would you just close your eyes? I don't want you to be distracted by anybody else. I want to pray with you. Maybe you have an area where you say, you know, I just need to repent. I've let something creep back in. It's willful. I'm not talking about you struggle and you're, you're trying to get away. I'm talking about you've let something come back in that you've decided, you know what? I'm just going to let this be. I don't think I can overcome it. I don't think I can deal with it. I'm just going to, you know, and you've grown numb and hard and callous to it. There's forgiveness if you'll confess it to him today. And you say, Pastor, would you just pray for me just real quick? Nobody looking around. Slip up your hand. I need to, I need to repent. Anybody? Okay, 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 okay. I'm going to pray for you. And then maybe you're here today and say, you know, I've been in church. Maybe you thought it's just a self-help tool. Maybe you think this is just group therapy and group counseling. Maybe you've never heard the stern warning that way that unless you repent of your sins and confess Jesus Lord, you could spend eternity in hell. I've never made, say, you say, I've never made Jesus Lord in my life. I've never just repented and asked him to forgive me and cleanse me from unrighteousness and and be the Lord of my life. If you're in this room, just lift your hand up real quick. I want to pray with you. Anybody? Anybody? Okay. Anybody? Okay. I want to pray with you. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I thank you right now for your word today. I thank you for the warning that is your gospel. That you came, that you walked this earth, a sinless life, 
And you laid down your life so that we could have eternal life. I pray, God, that we would not forget the warning of our story. I pray right now, Lord, for those who are struggling and say, I want to close the door on something that that I've let in. I need it to be cleansed in my life. I want to walk pure before you, Lord. I want to walk in righteousness. Lord, touch them today and help them. And by the confessing of this right now, Lord, that they are healed and they are free. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I want to pray over these elements. Lord, thank you for these elements that represent your body and your blood that was shed for us. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, that you allowed yourself to be beaten, to be wounded, and to be crushed for us to be healed. And that, Lord, your blood was shed for us to be forgiven. We, we thank you, Lord, and we sanctify these today in Jesus' name. Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take ye, this is my body, let us receive. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. Let us receive. Amen. 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 As you dispose of your cup, could you give God praise for salvation that we have in him, what he did for us. Lord, we thank you. We love you, Lord. We honor you today, Lord. Thank you that you made the way for us to have eternal life. Help us, Lord, to make that of the the highest importance when we share your name. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to take